Lynn Pappy Waldorf and Bob Simmons are an exclusive company right alongside some guys like Les Miles. Did you know that since 1933, only two quarterbacks in Oklahoma State history have ever won back-to-back bedlams? Take a guess before one of them comes home. You are Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma State Cowboys, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Howdy, y'all, and hello, all. Welcome back to Locked On Oklahoma State, your daily stop for all things cowboy and cowgirl related. My name is Cody Stovall. I want to thank you kindly for stopping by to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. You know you can find us on every single podcasting platform visually as well on YouTube. Find me personally on Twitter at All Day O State. Today, we're partially brought to you by Prize Picks. Do not miss out on the action, whether it's going to be two players you pick from or six players you pick from. Prize Picks gives you the ability to capitalize on your potential earnings. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Use that code for a first deposit match of $100 today. Ladies and gentlemen, back to back battle of W. It's a very rarefied era. Again, you do have to go back to 1932, 1933, the Lynn Pappy Waldorf days, and then you got to jump ahead to the Bob Simmons days. Bob Simmons had a very good record against OU. Les Miles was able to harness some of that as well. But a quarterback leading back-to-back Bedlam victories, it's Josh Fields, and you might have guessed it. He's top 10 in passing yards in Oklahoma State history. He's top 10 in passes in Oklahoma State history. Top 10 in rushing touchdowns in Oklahoma State quarterback history. Top 10 quarterbacks in all of Oklahoma State. And yes, you probably guessed it. He wore number 10. Ladies and gentlemen, help me bring on the show today. Tony, Lindsay, a Bedlam legend. How are you feeling today, sir? I'm good, Cody. Uh, feel real good. I mean, especially when it comes to talking about OSU. So uh, ready to start when you're ready. I love it, man. All right. So, yeah, we'll, we'll just uh, crank right into it. Again, when you look at some of um, the list of Oklahoma State quarterbacks, well, the list is very, very short. That's one back-to-back Bedlams. So, again, as I'm trying as much as physically possible to kind of make this week themed, the Legends Bedlam Week, because it's the last one, man. It's the last Bedlam for at least the next eight to ten years. I think it'll come back eventually, right? A lot of these big-time rivalries typically do come back over time. But this is the last ride. And part of the last ride, I think it's um, conducive for all fans to get re-engaged with the guys who are responsible for some of the biggest Bedlam victories of all time. And again, back-to-back. Not only uh, we're going to talk about how that happened, but before that, real quick, Tony, you helped revolutionize the game of quarterback at the position, but we'll save some of that for the end. How did you end up at Oklahoma State, and kind of what was that What was that process like for you? Oh, man. Um, I guess at the time I was being recruited by a couple different schools. Um, I wanted to go to Colorado. Uh, one of the reasons was Bob Simmons. Uh, and then just the love for the program over the years, me growing up and watching at home. Um, Coach Simmons didn't get the job, and Oklahoma State took him. Um, I stayed loyal to him. He stayed loyal to me as a recruiter. Um, and what not better way to stay with him and, and try to create something at a place that at that time um, needed to rebuild and make a name for themselves. And so he had a lot to do with that. Went on a recruiting visit. Um I ended up hooking up with David Thompson at the time, who was awesome. Um, oh, we, yeah. he, pretty much, he, he sold me on on the school. Um, of course, there were a couple okay. other schools that were um, had a lot of money at that time and had all the fancy facilities and, and big time coaches. And but it was something about Stillwater. It was something about the the people in Stillwater that I was introduced to um, that led me to stay um, loyal to Coach Simmons and, and to building that program. That is that is amazing. All right, so. Yes, it's funny you brought up Colorado. You beat me to the punch. Um, yesterday, I was watching, you know, some of your highlights of the old Bob Simmons show, um, and then I caught I caught something off of a podcast where you talked about how personal the '97 Colorado game was, um, and, and basically you broke it down that, that a lot of people thought that Bob Simmons should have got that job. Instead, they gave it to Rick Neuheisel at Colorado. So you're right. Yeah, I, I 
thought it was pretty interesting that uh, you came out looking to make a statement against Colorado, and you did that. So talk about that a little bit more. Like, uh, what what was making it so personal? Was it just the the fact that they overlooked Bob Simmons, or was there a little bit more? Because they were really, really, really good back then. A lot of people tend to forget. I think for me, it was to know that they had somebody in state um, that was worth giving a shot to, and I didn't talk to anybody at all. Um, and so the fact that that happened, okay. um, that kind of put me on edge to start with. Um, and then even during the re recruiting process, I thought, okay, maybe if they know I'm taking these trips to these different schools and they're offering me, then maybe they'll jump on board, you know, and make it happen. Um, mm -hmm. But I did not hear not a word, not a word from, okay. any, from, All staff, right. from any coach. And so I was like, okay, that's fine. I hope I get the opportunity to play you guys because once I do, I'm going to make you pay. And as many times as I can, you're going to regret not coming to get me or not even just reaching out and saying anything to me, being one of the top recruits in the state at that time. And so, I mean, it was already on my heart. I, I need to I need to get back at them. Um, and then the fact you add in Coach Simmons and everybody knowing that he should have got that job. And I, who knows what happened to this day, but he should have been there. Um, and so that kind of just added fuel to the fire. And so it was just building up and building up. And finally, I got that opportunity to make something happen. Well, I don't know if you saw, but yesterday the future schedules were released. I selfishly am very excited that our first year with Colorado, we get to go to Boulder. I can't wait for that. I, I'm super excited to go to Pro Provo, Utah as well. But talk a little bit about the, the Big A, Big 12 style of days whenever we transition, right? Because – 96 was the first year we added the Texas schools. Yeah. So your freshman year was really the beginning, the beginning times of the new Big 12. And that yeah. was still with, with Colorado. So just to get everybody's juices flowing for the trip to Boulder next year, <laughs> give us a little bit more insight uh, of the old school nature that Colorado used to have and, and why there's a possibility that they could be our new rival in the new Big 12. Oh, uh, if I guess if you look at the old school part of things, very talented, uh, traditional, strong um, football team, strong culture of the football team. It wasn't as glitz and glam as what it is now. Um, yeah. But if you take away the glitz and glam, <laughs> but you add what Dion plans to add, that's what the Colorado was of back then. Um, they were always nationally ranked. Um, they were always someone that everybody in the nation wanted to see. Um, and they were a powerhouse, uh, powerhouse at that time. And so something that Dion's trying to get back to, uh, bringing me back mm -hmm. to current days, um, the glitz and the glam is there. Uh, he's working yeah, on is. recruiting. Um, we'll see where it goes. I'm excited. It's a lot of excitement around this state, you know, about what's going on up there. Um, I just want to see them get back to the way they were. I 100% agree. I absolutely agree. And you know what? It was nice that uh, you got to have a good time with Colorado, 97. You corralled the buffs in Stillwater, 98. So before we get to 97 and 98 and how fun it was to, to party um, in, in those days, and hopefully we can kind of conjure some of that up uh, again this weekend. But briefly before we do that, y'all, I do have to remind you that today, today is a good day as any uh, to – Put yourself in a position to make some money. I just told you a little bit about Price Picks, so let me tell you a little bit more. Price Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in all of Northern America. It's the easiest and most exciting way for you to play daily fantasy sports right now. You don't have to get up, get caught up in the hoopla of choosing the crazy stuff, the overs, the unders, the props. You don't have to do all that. With Price Picks, all you do is pick two to six individuals. And then you go off of their stat projections and watch the winnings roll in from there. It is legitimately that simple. You choose more than or less than on the projected stats for individual players. Guys, we even got basketball season almost here. You can pick combo projections across football and basketball with specials. A league created specifically for combo projections that include two, two or more players from different sports and different leagues. So if you want to put LeBron James and Travis Kelsey in a combo, you can absolutely do that. Price Picks even offers the reboot policy. So if your entry stays in or gets injured in the first half of the game for football and basketball games now, 
the second half that player gets rebooted. Price Picks is the only daily fantasy platform with any insurance policy like that. It's super simple to play. You can make the picks and submit your entries in less than 60, 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals on your money and easy gameplay make Prize Picks number one in daily fantasy sports app. So do not miss out on the action. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Make sure you use that code locked on college, all one word, for a first deposit match up to $100. Prizepicks.com slash locked on college. Go there now. We'll match you up to 100 bones. All right, man, 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get lost in some of the sauce of the buildup for Bedlam, go watch some of those, those epic battles in 97, 98. The Bob Simmons show it does have a lot of really awesome quality stuff. And then it, it does, it conjures up even more memories of, dude, I forgot, honestly, how good Ethan Howe was. I also forgot that he was 6'2", 190, right? He could play in today's game. You could definitely play in today's game. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about 97 Bedlam, right? Because I know Colorado was squarely on, on your chest, and you got that taken care of. But the 97 Bedlam, like you had mentioned, David Thompson led us to the 95 Bedlam, right? We slipped up 96, 97. You were a really, really young cat. I don't think a lot of people expected you to go into Norman and uh, I don't know, put up a buck fifty through the air. Y'all rushed for 188 yards, and you, sir, I don't know if you realize this, but you were completing 14.3 yards per throw in that Bedlam game. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, a lot of stats I didn't even think of at the time, and so <laughs> I look at them nowadays and some old stuff. I'm like, okay, I did that. Wow, that's yeah. pretty good. Um, that was me. Yeah, that was me. Hey, um, but I, I didn't realize it, and I wasn't too caught up into the stats anyway. Um, right. I wanted to win, and you got to understand this too. Me coming from Colorado, I, I didn't know anything about Bedlam. I mean, it was it was a game to me, but it's I mean, it was a rival game. Um, yeah, I didn't know the impact that it had on the state. Um, I didn't know how huge it was, and so even with me being there for a year um, and being redshirted, but taking part in you know the '96. Uh, game, it still didn't register for me. Um, okay, gotcha. It, it was it was only until I started playing. So that ninety seven year, um, and just leading up to the game, I, I want to say two weeks before the game, um, okay. you could just feel it in the atmosphere. And it's like, okay, well, let me see what this game is about. Now I get to play, so let me see what this thing is about. And um, gosh, leading up to kickoff, man, it was everything um, I expected uh, in a rivalry, and it, it kind of opened up something new for me as far as, you know, the impact of that game and, and how much it was and how much it meant uh, to the team, those that played um, in Oklahoma in high school and then those that didn't. Yeah, but, oh, Tony, come on, man. Don't sell yourself short. Y'all didn't just win Bedlam two years in a row. You beat the ever-loving tar out of them because you, you did it again the, the following year, 1988. You put up a buck 50 through the air and almost another buck 50 uh, on the ground. And then on top of 97, where you were throwing for 4.3 yards per, per clip, you also threw for over 65% in the 98 bedlam. I know Devon Parker went a little crazy with like 220 yards rushing or something to that effect. But other than Devon Parker, that, that wasn't, much of a, wasn't much of a game. I think it was 41-27. So you yep. beat them 30-7 to seven, and then 41-27. to 27. Tony, those aren't just Ws, man. Those are whoopings. That's uh, why they're cherished so much. It, it was the plan, you know, especially in 97. I mean, with the season we had going anyway, I mean, we were ready for whoever, whenever. Um, that was that was our mentality. Like, we don't care who you are. Let's come and get some. You know, we're ready. We have everything we need. And we had the ball rolling. So, I mean, it was just a matter of time and getting on that field. So, we kind of cruised through that game, too. I mean, we knew that would give us a little bit of something. But we also know we were the better team in 97. Way better, and we proved it. And then going into 98, it's like, okay, um, we just got done with y'all a year before. There's not too much that has changed, and so now you got to come to us. Um, and they gave us a little fight at the beginning. Um, and right. then uh, I, I think Kenyatta put out the quarterback. And from that moment on, it really just – I mean, DeMond did his thing, um, but yeah, you need more than just one person. 
And, and uh, yes, proved, that was clearly evident. Right, yeah. and we proved we were the better team again that year. And so for those two years, I mean, we had the bragging rights. And, you know, going into the series, everybody knows, you know, which which way the series is leaning and has right. has went. Um, but anytime we got a chance to put it on them, you, you can be assured we're going to. So, yeah, dude, uh, I'm telling you, everybody out there, go look at some of that 97, 98 stuff because you will. Yeah, I mean, everybody remembers Kenyatta Wright going crazy. I think everybody remembers that the, the defensive tackle, Kevin Williams, and then the, the Hall of Fame career that he had in the NFL. But, dude, Andre Waddle was all over the place. Ethan Howe was yeah. a bad man, Jamma. We could talk about R.W. McCorders for hours and hours, so we're not going to do that. But, dude, I remember uh, Sean Love. Yep. Sean Love was somebody yeah, yeah. that – Dude, that guy, he had he had all of the ability. His sideline usage was impeccable, right? Even for back then. Yeah. And um it just, dude, it it was so much fun. And I think you nailed nailed it on the head. You said that that like the 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 intensity, right? You had to not only match them, but you had to show from the very get-go. We are the better team. It does help whenever you have guys like uh, Alonzo Mays to lay people mm -hmm. out, right? The, yeah. the good old days of the crackback block, whenever you got some of the Alonzo Mays size, was not very fun. <laughs> but, yeah, dude, we'll, we'll talk about um, some of the, the, the running style of stuff. But from a passing perspective, like, dude, 14.3 yards per clip and 65%. What about that game? Was it just a preparation? Did you come in overly prepared? Or either one of those games, did you just see things a little bit better than, than other times? Um, gosh, I, I think the, the more you play the game, the slower it becomes and the more you're able to do. And I think we were at a point to where, I mean, everything was moving, you know, slow for us. We saw it happening before it did, and we just capitalized on what we had. And so, yeah, preparation definitely – paid a part in it. I mean, going all the way back to the summer. I can remember the summer we brought in uh, Coach Dan Austin, and, man, he had us going. And, and we were prepared for the season. A lot had to do with him, and then a lot had to do with what we did week to week um, and just being able to do it in the games. And so um, preparation, um, but, again, us just knowing the game, us knowing where we needed to be, what we needed to be doing, and then dominating when we got to that point. Um, and it all kind of spoke for itself. Now the running style of things, um, I hear, I hear from a birdie that you just loved, absolutely <laughs> loved running track, right? <laughs> I, I don't know what birdie that was. Oh, that birdie, birdie was all wrong. Uh, never have, never will. I, I don't think I would even coach it. Really? No. Mm -mm. But you know what? Even it's it's one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. I can't say that. And there's no way I could have got out of it because from a lot of people that know, my dad was a coach, you know, and so yeah. I had no choice. I mean, it made me good on the, on the back end of everything, but uh, I still hate it to this day. Yeah, man, I, I would have never guessed that you didn't like track now, but you guys were actually very, very, very good at track, right? But your dad or your, your dad made a bunch of the football players uh, run. Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, if you look at our basketball team, uh, my senior year in high school, you look at the track team, uh, I want to say 80 to 90% of the guys who were on those teams were football players. That's smart, man. I, so <laughs> when, I, when I was in high school, yeah, the skill position players, I mean, I already ran track. Track was my first sport before football. So it was nothing to me. You know what I mean? I absolutely loved it. But I remember all of the O-linemen and D-linemen, they would have to wrestle. And, and I, I do, I, I know that a lot of them hated it. And right. I do know there's a decent amount of football players, especially secondary guys that were on track that hated being there as well. But, you know, as you were able to show that athleticism and that versatility, it's kind of unmatched, especially back then. Right. I'm not saying you're old by any stretch. All right. But I am saying <laughs> that, you know, Warren Moon wasn't super nimble. Fran Tarkenton was obviously very nimble. Um, Randall Cunningham was obviously extremely nimble as well, uh -huh. but other than that, man, Jerry Tar Tarkanian, there's not very many mobile quarterbacks or Johnny Unitas is what I meant to say. Sorry. That, that kind of, you know, conjure up the memories of, of, of that position. And then when you came to Oklahoma state, I think that was part of one of the reasons that, that I loved you because watching somebody run like a, like a track star, dude, I said it, I said it off air. I believe in it wholeheartedly. 
You were Vince Young before there was a Vince Young, 100%. And that's why I keep imploring people to go back and look at the film. Dude, you were you were good. Right. Like you were very, very good. When you took off, as a fan, as a kid, I was like, oh, first down. Like, <laughs> immediately. I was like, why don't we just run with him all day? And that is a question I had. Why didn't we, because the option wishbone was still kind of, it's not really prevalent, but it was still around a decent yeah. amount. Oh, you were still running a, a good amount of it. Why did we not adopt that system back then uh, with you and Jamal Fobbs back there? And, um, then, and then even Reggie, Reggie White. Yep. Um, I think a big part had to do with our uh, office and coordinator at the time. Okay. Coach Miles. Coach Les Miles. Um, Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. He, you know, he, he embedded that in us. And, you know, he's a Michigan man. Michigan wasn't, has never Old been school. an option team, but being in the Big Eight, big, being in the Big 12, where that was a trend. Um, Coach Miles picked it up, and he had guys that do it. And so, with the guys able to do it, you know, we 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 did it quite a bit. Not as much as the Nebraskas and and Missouris and Oklahoma. I mean, they were mm -hmm. they were really good at what they did. Um, but we did we were able to take bits and parts and kind of implement it in what we were doing, um, and had a lot of success with it. But I think it kind of died off because of Coach Miles, um, because um, of moving on. Who was the uh, – oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick myself for not remembering this. Who was the, uh, the, 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 the fullback, number 45? Brian Aikens. Brian Aiken, yes. Dude, like I loved how you guys would work off of the fakes to him because you'd hand it to him quite a bit. Yep. But then you would, you would not only work off of a fake on, this, on, the same, on the play side action, but you'd also fake one way and then reverse the other way with a pitch option. Like, dude, it was very creative and innovative, especially for back then. Um, and, and then, obviously, that's probably a good reason why, when Bob Simmons left, uh, a lot of the players were pretty big proponents of Les Miles, you know, getting that kind of elevated yes. position. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So, real quick, before we talk about, the, you know, the Vince Young before Vince Young, I got, I got to remind the people, everybody, um, again, we're in the capitalization of money-making season. Of course, we need our main man, Mike Gundy, to hit the capitalization as well. But for you, specifically, go to FanDuel right here, right now, because right now our new customers are getting $150 back in bonus bets with any winning on a $5 money line. Again, that's $150 back in bonus bets if your team wins. Easy peasy. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's not a better time to get in on the action. You already know. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use with a wide range of betting options, including money lines, player props, overs, unders, Heismans, conference champions, who's going to win the Super Bowl, and much more. So make sure you visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to kick off this NFL money-making season for you. Or if we're just here to hit the OVA or him of the OVA, go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to do it. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. All right, Tony. So whenever you look at today's game of college football, the athletic quarterback is like it, man, right? In today's game, if you're a, a statue-esque quarterback, you're probably not going to make it all that, all that far, right? Every quarterback out there, no matter what your size is, everybody's working on speed. Because you can, if you can integrate the RPO action into like the traditional drop back stuff and you can combine the two, it makes you a very versatile weapon. I mean, Oklahoma State fans have seen it for the last few years with, with Spencer Sanders. But again, before Spencer, before Zach Robinson, before J.W. Walsh, before Bobby Reed was you. So real quick, buddy, tell us um, what, what you think about the new age uh, running back a.k.a. quarterback second run. <laughs> and and do, do you kind of feel like you were just born in a little bit of a too, – too early of a generation? You know, I'll, start, I'll, I'll answer that last question first. I, I do. <laughs> I, I, I think I was way ahead of my time, and I think it would have been perfect, a perfect fit um, for me to be in today's game um, for the things that I did back then. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do wish I could hey, – Kind of to go back and then put me in this place, um, but it definitely helps um, the skill set that I had at that time. Um, now me seeing it evolve, um, I'm just happy. I'm yeah, happy, yeah. you know. Finally, it happened, and those who were getting overlooked, those who may not have got shots, are able to get it now because of the things you know that that 
I was able to do and a lot of others, even before me, I know Tony Jones was a quarterback before myself. Mm-hmm. And Tony had a lot of those skills too. He did, um, yes. So there were, you know, quite a number of people that, that came through. Um, but now seeing it take place and like I said, evolve into the quarterback play now, um, it's, it's awesome to see. Do you, uh, I know you're, you're a teacher now. Um, do you ever, every now and again, remind your kids that, hey, I used to be able to do that? <laughs> um, huh? When they come in at the beginning of the year and they kind of want to know a little bit about me and my history, I throw yeah. it out there. I don't go into detail of exactly what happened and my achievements or anything like that. It's pretty much like I went to school here. I got my degree. I was able to play football. <laughs> and then I leave it at that. But then I have a lot of parents um, that are my age and they were aware. And so they'll go tell their mom, dad, aunties, whoever. Yep. And then they'll come back to me like, oh, I heard about you. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it was a long time ago. I'm kind of, oh, so I was OK. <laughs> oh, man, you got to. Hey, next time, just counter with um, you've seen that Bedlam record. <laughs> yeah. Uh, go check out how many quarterbacks have beat them back to back. And just leave it at that, dude. Just leave it at that, right? Hey. All OU fans want to talk about is is the overall record, correct? Hey. And again, you and Josh Fields are in such rare company that you can tell them to stick it where the sun don't shine. That's amazing. <laughs> hey, and the way I look at it, and I did back then, and the years that we've won, is you're only as good as your last game. So, hey, if I won that year, then, hey, you, can't, you have nothing to say until you change that outcome. And you got a year to wait. So. Dude, I'm so glad you said that. I think this is the perfect segue because, just like you said, it the most important one is the last one, right? And this is literally last. the last one. So, oh, you fans want to talk about 90, 19, 7, over and over and over. I, I, I said yesterday to Reggie White, I'm pretty sure that's the only mathematical equations that are allowed to be taught in Norman public school system, right? Because they beat it into your head. Nobody, I mean, people are going to care. But most people, most people, especially in the recruiting realm, right? They're going to remember the last one because this is the last one. So I don't care about the other 90, 91, 92, whatever you want to call it. I care about this one. Yeah. So. Whenever you look at Oklahoma State and Oklahoma this year, obviously this is a big bedlam, right? This is We're both tied for first place in the Big 12. You've got K-State and Texas going on as well. So this weekend's going to decide a lot of the first place race. When you've seen the regalvanization of Oklahoma State this year from the bottom all the way to the top, we're running a completely different team now, right? And OU... For some reason, their fans are ready to run Jeff Levy out of the town. I find it hilarious. <laughs> I love that they're having a bunch of infighting right before Bedlam. But when you look at these two these two teams, how do you feel like the matchup uh, works out? Do you feel like there's there, there should be a natural favorite here, regardless of what team, or do you think it's pretty pretty evenly matched? Um, man, I I think looking at where they both are at this point in time, um, we figure some things out. Figured a lot of things out. Mm-hmm. And I think we kind of got that ball rolling. Um, where I think they've been the same since they started. So, yeah, of course, you'll get better week to week, but it's not like they've taken a large leap or anything like that. Um, but we have on the other hand. And so um, it's going to be a really good matchup. I mean, but they got to come to Stillwater, and they got to deal with what we've been doing these last couple of weeks, and I don't know if they're ready for that. Um, I think the defense has been playing a lot better. Um, like I said, offense is rolling. Ollie is killing. And yes. so I think it's going to continue, you know, with him. And oh, he's going to have to find some way to stop it. But I don't think it's going to happen this week. So that may be another team, maybe another year, but not this year. Uh, you were blessed with handing the ball off to several NFL uh, running backs over your time. But you're right. Ollie is something. And Reggie was telling me yesterday, you know, I asked him, what are one of the things that you think makes him elite? And he said, not only the jump cut, but what he can do off of a jump cut. Because usually mm-hmm. a lot of people can make the jump cut, but it's the next movement that's a stalling moment. All yes. he doesn't have that stall. Whenever he jump cuts, he's instantaneously hitting another gear. Mm-hmm. And, dude, he's the size of a linebacker, so you don't expect it, right? You don't expect him to be that fleet of footed, but he is, right. and he can run people over. I cannot wait to see him. I don't want to say smash face mask, right? You get in trouble nowadays. But 
<laughs> I can't wait him to steamroll over OU players. I just, dude, I'm so excited for this one. I try to, I try to cater my emotions because it's bedlam, right? right? And we're very scorned. But, dude, the more I talk to some of the old school guys like, like you and Tatum and Reggie, I get more and more excited. I'm, I'm ready for this one, man. And, and you're right. I don't think OU realizes quite what they're walking into. Yep. Yep. I do believe that they think it's, you know, it's bedlam. They're going to win. They always think that way. They always feel that way. But the energy of the 2021 bedlam, because we thought that one was the last one in Boone, right? Yeah. That energy, if that's recreated, which the feeling around campus right now, I, I'd say is pretty good. Yeah, if we can capture lightning in a bottle again and punch OU in the mouth repeatedly, I like our chances, buddy. I, I like really them too. Do. I think you hit on something. You said punch them in the mouth repeatedly. It needs. It can't just be from the start, you know, because the game is start. The ha- atmosphere is hype. This mm-hmm. has to be something that takes place all four quarters. That's. I think that's going to be key. Um, but if we can keep the momentum going from today to tomorrow into the game, and it stays like that that whole time, it's it's going to be a tough place for. For them to get anything done is speaking on all OU's behalf. It's going to be hard, and we're going to come out victorious because we we should do the things we need to do. And so I'm excited. I wish I wish I could be there. I'm a high school football coach, so every year that this takes place, I'm so ah. busy coaching our high school team that I can't get out to see it. Um, yep. But you know, I'm there. I'm watching. I'm cheering and everything else. And I can't wait, man. I'm I'm pretty hyped up right now. So you need to try, all right? You need to try to schedule a date to maybe play hooky when we play Colorado next year in Boulder. I'm just, I'm just saying, right? It's a good time to get sick. I don't know. <coughs> yeah. right. I, I, I will be there. Um, that's one thing I can't guarantee, them coming here and, and just the way things work out. Um, I'll be able to make it, and I'll be there, and – It'll be good to see Coach Gundy. Um, For those that don't know, Coach Gundy is part of the reason I got to Oklahoma State as well. He was recruiting me as a quarterback. Unfortunately, he left when I got there. Um, But between him and Coach Miles and Coach Simmons, man, um, they they, they got me to to head there. And so it's always good to see him, talk with him. It's always good to see people in the counseling office um, that are still there, that work with me. Um, and so it's, it, it'll be a good time. Anytime I get to hook up with any OSU online. I love it, man. I absolutely love it. And you know what? If it's going to be a fist fight in the box, then I think maybe that will allow us to party like it's 97, 98 <laughs> again. I'm okay with that. All right, brother, man. I right. greatly, greatly appreciate your time. Um, and I know you, you don't do a lot of the social media stuff, but Go ahead and let the fine people know what who you guys got up coming up this week and 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 where your where your your team is and the projection that you think you're gonna have for the remainder of the season with your ball club. Go ahead, sir. Well, I mean, I'm I'm here uh, in Denver, I'm coaching for a regional team called the Far Northeast Warriors, and there's a lot that oh God, there's a lot that's going on with this program, but uh, we're in Northeast uh, region of Denver. Um, we are finishing up our week. Uh, my last week here, um, not only as a season, um, but as a program, they're dissolving the program. And so we just want to want to finish oh out strong. Yeah, we want to finish off strong with what we're doing. And and we'll see where the journey leads us after this uh, after the season ends. Well, we don't. Well, you know what, man? We'll definitely have to link up. Uh, I, I live in the Springs. I'm actually just just back uh, for or Bedlam and homecoming and all the festivities and, and being around campus and all that fun jazz. So, uh, yeah, I will also uh, be at the game in Boulder, which is why I'm selfishly super excited. Yeah. Same goes for Provo, Utah. But, Tony, watching you when I was a young kid is one of the reasons that I absolutely fell head over heels in love with Oklahoma State. So it's an absolute honor to have you on the program. And I do know that there's a lot of old school Cowboys uh, that that are they're going to be very very happy to hear from you and get a check in. So we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah. But until then, thank you very much for giving me some of your time. It's been an absolute honor, sir. Thanks a lot, Cody, for having me on. I enjoyed it, man. And I need to do more of this. Get back in and and to things with uh with OSU.
So thanks a lot. Yeah, man, you're one of the top 10 greatest of all time to do it. And we've been doing this thing since 1895. Okay. <laughs> top 10 in that amount of time. You need to take your roses and bows occasionally too, sir. Do not forget yes. that. I, I definitely will. I appreciate them. I guess I'm just too humble, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, buddy. I got you. All right, go Pokes. And appreciate yes, it again. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, that's all we're going to have for this one right here. But stay tuned this afternoon. We're having Jeremy Smith on the program as well. The same Jeremy Smith that was a four-star running back recruit that chose Oklahoma State over those gooners 71 miles south. All right, y'all. You know I love you. As always, God bless. Go Pokes. And thank you for tuning in to make this your first listen here on Locked On Oklahoma State. You could be anywhere. We are so happy that you choose to be here. Let's keep this bedlam, hate, flowing rivers of orange all week. All right, y'all. Later, taters.